just like there is variations in the width of your rib cage or the length of your arms relative to your thighs, etc. There are the, there's always these anatomical differences seen in different uh, ethnic groups of people. Same applies to the height of the arch. There's many different variations and being flat footed is not necessarily a bad thing. So, Gorgon from My Foot Function, but for the first time now, I'm having you on the podcast. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Celeste. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you. Absolutely. And likewise, we've also followed you for some time and really appreciate the content that you put out there and you do inspire us, like, I, like I've mentioned before. Um, so I'm really excited to, to have this conversation uh, with you and looking forward to get started. Yeah, especially to inspire people just to have a bit more uh, of a well-rounded approach with their feet and understand the value of it. And we're going to get into that. But before, can you just tell us a little bit about you and Joseph and how you got to where you guys are? Absolutely. Um, so me and Joseph, we've been working together for about 13 years. We met um, teaching at a uh, personal training school. So for many years, we educated personal trainers. And to cut a long story short, the, the, the way we kind of uh, got here it was um, partly through taking several other educations, um, with uh, primarily with a guy known um, as Lee Saxby. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. No. He's uh, been our mentor through this um, whole journey about foot function. Uh, and we got incredibly inspired because we realized um, that um, through our own personal experience, but also being so involved within the health and fitness industry and teaching a lot of health and fitness professionals, and my background also being in sports science and biomechanics, uh, Joseph's being in sports coaching and as an elite rugby uh, player and coach, he, we realized that it's, it's a subject that is um, missing almost completely within the, the health and fitness field. Um, and it's something that um, is also very, uh, not necessarily misunderstood, more mistreated in the way, in the sense that there is not many uh, approaches other than um, trying to support the foot through more passive means, such as orthotics and certain shoes that try and keep the foot in a fixed posture to try and fix certain postural faults. So, and then that's things we can obviously get into, uh, but mm -hmm. we got incredibly inspired and thought this is something that we need to get out there. Um, we did a personal journey ourselves in improving our feet. And we slowly started uh, holding educations um, after being educated ourselves uh, within Sweden. These were primarily physical educations where we were talking a lot about foot function and the foundation essentially to human movement. We were coaching a lot of runners as well. Um, and then hit pandemic, uh, we uh, luckily we started also um, developing things online because we, we wanted to reach out to a, a wider audience. And that's where jo Joseph had the idea of um, creating my foot function. Um, so we got started with that and that's where the Instagram account started. And we continued during the pandemic period to develop these courses online. And quickly we saw that there was a, a global need for this, right? Because uh, as mentioned, it is a subject that um, needs the, at least the, the kind of preventive and more functional approach to treating foot pathologies um, is something that a lot of people want and need, but is not readily available out there. So we, it's been our mission since then to educate people um, and spread awareness and also provide the means to be able to empower themselves so that they have a different alternative or people have a different alternative but also to educate professionals um, such as podiatrists, doctors, chiropractors, physiotherapists through our instructor workshops where we teach them how to assess, but also through these assessments, how to apply exercises uh, to improve various forms of foot dysfunction or pathologies. Amazing. And also what's so fascinating is that even people that are very well educated in the world of health, biomechanics, well-being, physical therapists, you know, we've gone through rigorous training, uh, <laughs> still uh, prescribing, you know, to wear a little inch heel, and that's going to be the thing to do. And, you know, got to get those insoles in, otherwise people's arches will collapse. So there's still a lot of outdated information out there. Yeah. Um, so it's good to hear that you guys are actually doing this. Where I, I think I almost had a meltdown the last time you and I spoke, because I was like, oh my goodness, every time I turn on the TV, and there's some kind of professional sporting event whether that be football or rugby these guys are running around in the most ridiculous pointy toed footwear like yeah. what why is like 
functional wide toe box footwear not in the sporting world yet yeah it is it is when you know what you know and we you know what we know kind of you do kind of get um baffled uh, as to why it hasn't um developed any further than that and how and why kind of fashion steers the uh, design of um particularly the toe box and the shape of the toe box the design of uh, the shoes for a lot of athletes, um, and uh, let alone you know the general public, and it's not an easy question to answer because there is no real clear answer to that really, um, and uh, it is frustrating to see. But we are seeing an emerging trend, not only in a lot of more people being interested in this, uh, but also a lot of athletes being becoming more aware of this, um, because we have seen um, through the development and the advancements of um shoes for athletes and the general public in uh trying to prevent and minimize injuries that really nothing has happened statistically speaking over the several decades we have you know developed these um high tech kind of shoes that are supposed to reduce injury rates so really we've got to take a step back and look at it with a more critical eye and, and see what is really going on and what do we need to change yeah, and I think this is a perfect moment in the interview to actually talk about the history of footwear, which I can just say you guys have done such a good job of educating people about this on your platform. Guys, if you haven't yet, head to My Foot Function on Instagram and go and look at the beautiful illustrations that Joseph and Gorgon have put together for you guys to see. Just, I mean, there's some pretty wild things, even people recognizing that narrow toe boxes are a problem but also the the kind of pointy toes and how the aristocrats thought that this was more wonderful and you know the longer the toes and the more pointy the toes the more wealthy you were but can you give us a rundown of the history of, of footwear uh, absolutely i mean it's it's a long history um but, <laughs> nutshell um, nutshell <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Um, so there is a very, very interesting book from the 18th century um, that we found very fascinating. We have a big collection of, of historical books looking at um, shoes, and there's one called Fashion and Deformity. I forget the author's name, uh, but maybe we can link it into the podcast if people are interested in, in looking this up. But it goes uh, to show how the, the design of uh, modern footwear, which dates back to, you know, 15th, 16th century, really, when these um, pointed type of shoes became more predominant. Um, and there really is nothing more behind it than fashion, right? And it's a cultural thing, depending on what cultures, and it's more typical, obviously, in the Western, more developed societies, where we see this kind of pointed, um, narrow toe box. Um, and when the mass production of shoes began through the Industrial Revolution, um, this became more standardized because when they started to develop shoe lasts, which is typically um, essentially a mold of the shoe made out of wood. Uh, typically today they make them of plastic, also wood a lot of the times, which predetermines the shape of the whole shoe. And this is what you use to build the material on top of. So the shoe lasts were then created with this kind of narrow toe box shoe uh, and, those, and those shoes were then mass produced. And this quickly became the norm. Right within the within the industry, um, and then there's a lot of other things that we can get into apart from that narrow toe box, which causes a lot of other types of uh, foot deformities. But it is um, we believe through that um, standardization of how shoes were created through the industrial revolution, passed down from what was um, viewed to be aesthetically more pleasing and fashionable to today is kind of still stuck on, and I believe that has to do with that has become such a norm that it is almost viewed as natural or you don't question it because if you see it everywhere, everyone's using it down to, yeah. you know, physiotherapists, doctors, you don't question it. And what is easily, you know, what, what's uh, the norm easily becomes misconstrued as what, what is natural and normal as well. So mm -hmm. um, to cut a long kind of history short that I think that's at least our hypothesis of how and why uh, we still wear these kind of shoes today. I mean, there are really very few fashion trends that have stuck around as firmly as the narrow toe box and elevated heel. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, most things go through some kind of evolution, but the poor foot has literally been squeezed into these unnatural shapes. I want to say decades, but it's longer. I mean, it's centuries yeah. now. It's going into centuries, which is quite frightening. Mm -hmm. 
Exactly. And, um, you know, it's not, I mean, it, you, in that book, Fashion Deformity, they, they draw parallels um, with this in certain tribes in Africa, for example, you know, where they wear the rings uh, progressively more and more to eat oh, long yeah. neck. Um, yeah. That's one thing, right? Or other kind of body modifications that are perceived to be within that culture more aesthetically pleasing or uh, uh, a perception of status within that society or, or, or culture or group. Um, and I think that's what it comes down to. Uh, and a uh, case, an example when it comes to the shoes is the heel, the elevated heel, right? The functional purpose of the elevated heel is so that your shoes or your feet rather could stay within the stirrups when you're riding horses. Okay. So that's why they initially developed the heel. And obviously back then, if you had a horse, you generally had more power, influence and money, right? So it becomes a Got status you. symbol to go around in elevated heels. Um, and this became a norm as well, obviously. Um, and the, yeah, so essentially we're in a way stuck in the dark age when it comes <laughs> to our shoes, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's crazy that even like athletes are still having to bear the brunt for fashion um, yeah. because these poor people are running around on their poor little foundations that are crumbling beneath them. And we, you know, I think it's the norm for, I mean, athletes that are have a long career to mm -hmm. end it in their 40s but potentially if we actually addressed footwear earlier maybe that would be considered quite a short career who knows the, the sky's the limit at the moment if we can just address some of the more basics of human anatomy um let's talk a little bit about what are some of the issues that people can find themselves faced with if they are wearing footwear that's inappropriate um, the list is pretty long, but if we stick, let's go to, to some of the big ones, the big ones. Um, so the major <laughs> ones that, um, the big ones for me is something that would have a big and negative impact on your quality of life. Right. And this, there is research out there to prove this as well, that typically people that do suffer from foot related pain do generally obviously, um, have a lower quality or lower perceived quality of life. Um, but the typical things um, that do occur when you wear these shoes um, for an excessive period of your life is uh, the deformities of the forefoot, right? The most common ones being hallux valgus. So that would be the deviation of the big toe from its natural position towards the second toe. Along with hammer toes, when the smaller toes kind of curl up and there's different variations of these like claw toes or mallet toes and bunionettes, for example. So these are common deformities and don't always cause pain, um, especially when you're young. But as we age and we get older and um, body generally deteriorates, um, we, uh, the, the body's pretty good at compensating up until the point it is not, right? So exactly. um, eventually you'll start suffering from symptoms of pain. And this doesn't necessarily always have to be at the foot, but it is very commonly at the shins, at the knees, at the hips, at the back, and so on, the whole uh, body essentially. And it's hard to kind of pinpoint and research exactly where the kind of origin was of that pain. But we do know that when we treat um, foot dysfunction through the practice we have, a lot of symptoms of pain in the knees and the hips do get much better, if not disappear at all, uh, uh, altogether. Um, so when it comes to um, treating uh, these type of foot pathologies, uh, there's different ways about it. But um, the most difficult things people uh, do get faced with when you do wear it for an excessive period of time, especially when you get, you know, into your mid 30s, 40s and above, where the joints tend to become more rigid or even calcified, it becomes a lot harder to reverse through exercise, for example, or functional tools. And this is where a lot of people do become reliant on, say, orthotics, for example. Um, and... Um, so that, that's a major thing to consider. And the, the sooner you can do it, the better. Um, but uh, the most common foot deformities and pathologies would be bunions, bunionettes, hammer toes, metatarsalgia, inflammation of the forefoot, stress fractures, Morton's neuroma, pinching of the nerve between the metatarsal mm, heads. So painful. Yeah. Um, heel spurs or plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, all these are very typical of um, modern footwear. 
Oh, well, thanks for giving us the long old list. I mean, you've just <laughs> rattled that off like an absolute pro. Um, let's just talk a little bit about what, what would um, some sensible things folks at home could do now to help their feet. I mean, I know that obviously addressing those issues that you have said comes along with a long list of variables to consider, such as age, as you said, you know, if someone's a bit further along in their journey, maybe just doing a few tips is not going to completely rectify the issue. But, you know, you being you, giving all the good advice around feet, what are just a couple of things that you would go, you know, if the whole population just did this, this and this, Ah, I would breathe a sigh of relief. My work here is done and I can die a happy man. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, us being human beings and, and um, the nature of the way we work essentially is we don't change our habits um, unless, it unless the inconvenience is too great, right? Um, so I don't want to inconvenience people. So I'm not going to give you a list of 10 exercises to do, but the, the most powerful thing most people can do um, and this obviously depends on the degree of deformity and dysfunction and pain you have but for most generally healthy people the best thing you can do is invest in a good pair of wide foot shaped shoes and along with that uh, tools such as toe separators or toe spacers that help align the toes passively and once the toes get more aligned to their natural position they get into that mechanically advantaged position so that the muscles associated to the toes get more active. Because just by wearing, uh, for a lot of people, more functional footwear or wider footwear doesn't necessarily mean that the toes will automatically spread back into the natural position. So you need to encourage yeah. this, right? So just like over years and decades of use of shoes that cause this, we can encourage the opposite if we wear shoes that encourage that and spacers that also encourage that. That may be too big of a jump in transition for some people, and this is where exercises are encouraged uh, and appropriate so that you minimize any risks of that transition as well. Yeah, I think it is worth quickly jumping in and saying, guys, you know, if you are going to make the transition into minimal footwear, there might be some teething problems that happen along the way. You know, it's quite common for people to go you see this online, it makes me so sad where they're like, you know, minimal footwear is a load of rubbish. I hurt my back wearing minimal footwear. And I'm thinking to myself, the first time I ever wore heels, I hurt myself quite badly <laughs> as well. But you know, that's not exactly gonna be splashed all over social media because it just seems obvious if you're doing something for the first time aggressively, your body has to adapt. So yeah, there's always gonna be low and slow is the advice, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And there's very simple exercises you can do as well along that that don't take a lot of time or effort. And we post these regularly on our Instagram to inspire and encourage people to explore their feet more and explore movements that you're maybe not very used to or knew that your feet or toes could do at all. And this could be a fun thing to do uh, yourself or with friends as well, because it is from our experience when we do hold a lot of physical workshops. Uh, or work with clients online as well, is that when we just ask them, for example, to try and disassociate the big toe from the lesser toes, right? This becomes very challenging for a lot of people, but is an innate function that we should have. And a lot of people will find them trying to steer their toes with their fingers, for example, because that <laughs> pathway is not there anymore. And it could become a fun way of learning and trying to um, uh, get more in touch with your feet. So just doing that, for example, um, is a powerful, just starting point exercise, just learning how to control your toes will go a very long way. And there's research to, to show that as well nowadays, just doing those, those toe dissociation exercises. Amazing. Yeah. And actually coming from a neural background myself, the mapping of the feet actually occupies quite a large neural space in your brain. And we know that if we can light up these large cortical areas, we see a lower in overall threat and that can obviously then lend itself to better outputs. So one of the things I actually also want to take a quick sidestep to and talk about, because I remember being at university learning about the feet and they spoke about flat feet. And, you know, that's maybe something that we need to help people with because that has repercussions uh, that come along with it. But, you know, living in London, there's a large Asian community here. And it did kind of dawn on me that there was a lot of people from certain ethnic backgrounds that had these arches that were flat and their toes were spread out and they were doing pretty well. They didn't actually have that many physical complaints. 
So, I mean, this is where I wanted to get maybe a little bit more information and, and advice from an expert like you. If you have got arches that are flat, is that automatically something that we should be concerned about? What would you suggest? No, absolutely not. Uh, just like there is variations in the width of your rib cage or the l length of your arms relative to your thighs, etc. There be, there's always these anatomical differences seen in different uh, ethnic groups of people. Same applies to the height of the arch. There's many different variations and being flat footed is not necessarily a bad thing. And this is where we need to discern between being a, having flat foot or uh, what you would call acquired flat foot or a collapsed arch, right? Being born with a flat foot is not necessarily a bad thing um, because it's just, just just that anatomical height of your arch. As long as you have healthy and strong toes and a forefoot that are there to control the arch and the rest of the foot, you should be fine. You couldn't really worry about the height of your arch. Okay. And also, can we just quickly take a little sidestep? Because one of the things that I know shoes do by pulling the toes towards each other, that actually means that the arch then collapses. So can you just elaborate a little bit more? Because I feel like you, you touched upon the fact that toes are the important part. Can you just expand a bit more for, for the listeners at home? Absolutely. So we put a lot of emphasis and talk a lot about the big toe, right? This is probably something you've seen and heard and anyone that follows us um, do. And this is for a very good reason is because if we do observe the, the big toe in the first metatarsal, um, this big long bone that leads to the big toe, we will notice quickly um, that it is obviously a lot bigger, but it is also uh, it has also four times higher bone density than all the other toes. So this toe has obviously evolved to take a lot of weight, right? And the big toe is steered also separately from the other toes, what we're talking about, the toe dissociation. And as you said, it takes a big and also a separate part of the brain, specifically the big toe. Um, so essentially what we, what we call the big toe is like the rudder of the foot, right? It helps us steer the whole foot. So when it comes to a collapsing foot or a foot that tends to overpronate, um, if um, we look at how the foot moves during normal gait. So when we strike the ground, typically when we're walking, we'll strike the ground with the heel first. And then we'll roll with our weight towards the forefoot. As this happens, the foot is also rolling inwards. And this is what we know as pronation. So it rolls inwards and the arch starts to depress and the whole foot elongates as a result of this. And the forces in your body weight, body weight literally goes towards the big toe. So if that big toe is not in position and ready to catch that weight, traveling in that direction. So if it fits in this direction, then it's not able to decelerate that pronation moment. And this is where a lot mm. of people continue to pronate. Yeah. Um, so this is really the root cause of acquired flat foot or people having collapsed arches or not being able to control their pronation. And that's also what then it ends up looking like a bunion because the additional calcification on that big toe joint then leads to the bunion forming. I mean, I remember being a yoga teacher, gosh, it was a long time ago now. And I had this private client who had really severe bunions. They were super deformed, her little feet, bless her. And she was like, you know, this is genetic because I had my children and all of my children at the age of 10 years old developed the exact same feet. And I didn't have the confidence back then to, well, I think it was the right thing not to say anything. I just nodded and smiled, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, actually this is, bunions are not genetic, right? Like that is no. not a thing. No, it's uh, foot deformities. Um, um, ones that people are born with are extremely rare. It's like 0.01% of the population, I think. And, and that's these... usually like talipes, isn't it? That's usually yeah. like um, when the... Oh, club foot yeah and they've actually got to wear little orthotics since babies yeah i remember learning about that it's extremely rare right there are genetic um factors that predispose you to acquiring certain foot deformities like bunions a lot easier than other people would mm. so a typical a two typical um genetic factors would be that you're for example born with uh wider feet much wider feet than many other people are which means that when you use the same shoes as the person next to you that perhaps has narrower feet, your toes are gonna to get squeezed a lot more. 
Another factor um, which increases the risk is being hypermobile. So being very, having very mobile joints, which makes it a lot easier for pressure being applied to, again, misalign your toes. So this is nothing that we're born with. Uh, there's no research to show or prove this at all, but it's easy to believe that because um, these deformities start at a very early age. Obviously, in a lot of cultures, we put shoes on our kids as soon as they can walk and stand oftentimes. And granted, a lot of the shoes are a bit wider, less pointier and better, um, but not all of them are. And we generally, um, not to the parents' fault, but aren't you know, educated within footwear and appropriate footwear for our kids either. And we don't check the size of that footwear often enough. So kids often outgrow their footwear before they're changed. And because the feet are incredibly malleable at those ages, I mean, the bones aren't even fully developed. It, it doesn't take a lot to start uh, causing harm even then. And this is where it's very easy to believe, oh, well, I mean, I had it since I can remember or my kids had it and et cetera. All you have to do is look at the shoes they had and you'll see the common denominator there. And you didn't even mention socks. Think of the socks that we put little babies' feet in and how that squishes their little toes together. And let's be honest, I mean, I only about a year ago decided to invest because I don't know why they're so much more expensive, but in the socks that have five little gaps, <laughs> like a little hug for each little individual toe, um, where my toes are able to move and spread out without being compressed together. Yeah, so this is something as well that's not as often talked about, but it is just as important, absolutely. Um, and this is why we also um, use exclusively toe socks. I mean, they're a bit more difficult, obviously, to manufacture than regular socks, which is why the price point is a bit higher. But I think they're definitely worth it. Um, it makes using toe spacers a lot more comfortable and easier uh, as well. But when it comes to kids, um, yeah, I, I don't, I think it's very, I mean, it depends what climate you're in, but if you're indoors typically, which a lot of people are, uh, and where you can be barefoot, I think it's so unnecessary to have socks on kids. Um, because it, the, the, I mean, a lot of them will have these kind of grippy pads under the, the socks as well. But I mean, it's so much better for them to just completely be barefoot, I think. I mean, you're preaching to the choir over here, Gorgon, but I know a lot of parents that would, they, you know, I think it's not even, it, it's not even that the kid's shoes are very pointy or have a heel, but that the sole is incredibly rigid. And I mean, I'm going to get you to elaborate, but with the foot has so many components. And as you mentioned so beautifully before, is meant to move quite a lot during every step, but these flat rigid souls don't actually allow for that. No, exactly. And um, when it comes to these shoes, the thickness and the density of the sole matters. Uh, the density um, factor is where if it's very squishy and soft, um, first of all, we, we have a lot of um, sensors under our feet. We have uh, seven different types of so-called mechanoreceptors under our feet that are incredibly sensitive to pressure and stretch. So when we put something very soft and squishy between our feet and the ground, these um, sensors are essentially desensitized. So we can't as easily feel differences in texture, variation, pressure, stretch, et cetera. And this um, leads to poor um, motor control overall because the way we learn movement as we mature is through the, when we're obviously, because most of the time we're in direct contact with our environment with our feet, if we're obviously up on our two feet, right? So, and this is why we have um, the highest density of sensory nerves in our feet than anywhere else in our body, apart from our hands. And that's because we're supposed to be able to feel the environment, right? So that the body and the brain knows when we are uh, exposed to high risk situations, such as high impact, which means that the brain should be able to then quickly adjust your motor patterns so that you can meet this kind of demand in a more appropriate way. And this is essentially how we learn movement through play, right? So children will naturally explore, do a lot of different things, jump, run, squat, et cetera. And this through this movement and that sensory input that the brain learns what's good and what's not through that sensory input. So and we know this through research, and, and this is an experiment a lot of people at home can do if you have kids or if you have family that have kids, 
you can have your kids um, run around um, in padded shoes and just observe. Now, the better experiment actually is to have kids that have just learned to walk, which um, means that they, they fall quite often when they're trying to walk, right? And you can find note down how often they fall with and without shoes, and you'll probably notice quite a big difference there. And they'll be moving as if you just observe how they move. It looks a lot more awkward when they're moving with these shoes rather than not. And the same thing happens to animals, right? If you observe dogs, for example, sometimes people will put these shoes on them because for some reason, you know, some of them, yeah, exactly, will have some uh, allergic reaction to grass, believe it or not. To, to it's really grass. funny so, when they like, like, don't yeah, about, and exactly. they, it's almost like they take bigger steps. It's really cute, yeah. but like, obviously changing their gait pattern dramatically. Exactly. And the same thing happens to, to us humans, right? And, and this um, hinders the development of our gross motor skills. It takes longer time for us to develop the skills, but it also develops them in an, um, a less efficient manner. We tend to learn how to overstride, take too long steps, um, both when we're running and when we're walking. So it's definitely um, something that all parents should be very aware of uh, and to encourage uh, more movement barefoot as much as possible especially during that critical phase when they're still learning how to walk and run and stand etc i know and i'm going to put my neck on the line and say every phase is critical because particularly as you start to age you know you need to have developed those neural maps and they always say uh, sensory before motor so if we can actually expose our feet to a variety of sensations as we would do in nature we're building those neural maps which is then going to set us up for better mechanics and better movement better balance yeah just better everything absolutely right uh, and you know if we go to the other kind of um, end of the spectrum in terms of age when we're talking about elderly people, one of a uh, very big factor is fall risk, right? A lot of elderly people, unfortunately, when they fall, the, the um, risk of unfortunately dying becomes a lot higher because of complications from that fall. And um, unfortunately, we have our elderly walking around in extremely padded shoes. And that's not to say that they don't need them because some people will need more padding, but you can actually have more sensory input by where, by using sensory insoles, for example. But a lot of people will also be able to just use more minimal footwear because they're not jumping and running. They're just taking a few steps a day and just having thinner soles where they can get more in contact with the ground actually has been shown to have a better um, improvement in balance and posture. That is a beautiful segue into an argument that I constantly have with my partner. <laughs> Because he's always like, he's always trying to get me to run and I'm someone who has dabbled, but the love for the running is very low. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will often come home and be like, oh no, that hurt me. You know, this is hurting and that's hurting. And he's always saying, you know, if you only wore some decent footwear with proper <laughs> padded soles, you wouldn't find these problems. And I'm thinking... I think it's the opposite. I think I need to run in my barefoot shoes. So can you um, end this marital disagreement and please uh, be on my side? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, okay. Um, so uh, when it comes to running, uh, what we have to appreciate there is that the forces are substantially higher than when walking. Walking is about 1.25 times your body weight. Running is two, three times your body weight. So it's a lot of forces per step, right? Um, and when your foot is an, a completely functional, as it should be, um, expecting it to absorb those forces in an efficient manner without cushion on very hard surfaces may be troublesome and may actually lead to injury, right? There is um, also um, case and example when the whole kind of barefoot revolution started 2009 after the re release of the Born to Run book and the 2007 Harvard study by Dan Lieberman, which showed overstride and higher impact forces in cushioned uh, uh, running shoes, a lot of people attempted to run more barefoot, right, without any form of kind of transition, obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, which led to a lot of injuries, particularly stress fractures at the metatarsals and also Achilles issues, because um, not necessarily because they were running in less padding, it's because the gait and the way you run doesn't necessarily change just because you go to minimalist footwear. A lot of people will still have that poor um, gait as they're running, overstriding, leading to higher impact forces, et cetera. But along with having feet that may not be able to absorb the forces, that increases the risk. And if you are um, 
statistically speaking, the older you are, the higher the risk, because the more years you spend in restricted footwear, the longer it's going to take for your foot to function more optimally during running. Um, for us, <clears throat> through our experience and through the knowledge, uh, through the research, we can see um, how padded your shoes are is not the most important thing. This is something that I think people focus too much on in functional footwear. The most important thing is the shape and the width of the toe box, because that is the determining factor of how well you can absorb the impact force, how well your whole foot can splay and expand in its total surface area to accommodate those forces. So when we um, uh, think about what footwear to use, it's highly dependent, but I would advise to, first of all, look at the shape and width of the toe box, secondary, how much padding. Some people are going to need more padding because of the deformities of the foot leading to uneven pressure distribution at the bottom of the foot, um, which leads to pain, right? So, and especially if you're running on very flat, hard, even surfaces, and you have that uneven pressure distribution, you're constantly impacting higher forces in certain areas of your foot, such as certain metatarsal heads, leading to pain and discomfort. So actually there would be better to use more padding. Now, I don't know how your foot looked like necessarily, but um, if you are experiencing just pain going out and running in very minimalist footwear, using footwear that is zero drop, um, as long as you have good ankle mobility and tendon elasticity. So the ability of the tendon to recoil in a stretch position, because otherwise this also commonly leads to Achilles injuries. But having a slight padding, zero drop, and an accommodating toe box um, oftentimes will be better for you in the long run, especially if you're just running on asphalt, which is the, the environment that we usually live in. But if you are going to be running in more minimalist footwear, the better thing there to do is run in uneven terrain because your foot strike will never all constantly strike in the same place in the same region of the foot, leading to less overuse injuries and problems. Um, so unfortunately, I'm not very strictly on your side, but there is, I mean, I'm on both of your sides, right? You have, well, a, and he has a point as well. In the, uh, but I think when you do move on to more padded shoes or, or are using padded shoes, a very important thing there, um, because we know that too much padding leads to gait alterations, which in turn may lead to injury. It's important to get your technique analyzed to make sure you have an efficient and injury-free running pattern when you're running with padded shoes as well. And if you do have that and an accommodating toe box, then you're, you know, you're minimizing the risks um, a lot better. Yeah, I basically was a good girl and I was running off road. I was finding every little pathway and I was swerving it like it was hot lava. <laughs> and I was making sure I was on all the weird surfaces. So I was being a good girl. I was doing that. Yeah. It's something that you keep saying as a long stride length. And actually, that's something my partner Dan always teases me about. And he does like, he actually imitates the walk. He calls it the walk, where it's like really long steps. And I always believe it's because I'm really small and I've got to try and keep up with my tall friends. <laughs> So can you just give me a little bit more of an indication, like how should I adapt that? And if anyone else is listening, that also takes really big steps, <laughs> what should we be doing? Absolutely. Um, so um, we can take it in both running and walking because people do tend to overstride in both um, because not only because of padding, but also because of the elevated heel, which forces you to take a longer stride. Um, the, the easiest, the best way to um, adjust your stride length is by going through how many steps you take per minute. So when you're walking, you want to be trying to take about 85 or between 80 and 90 steps per minute for optimal stride length. When you're running, so running speeds, which is anywhere from about eight kilometers an hour, um, you can even run obviously slower than that, but typically between eight to 20 kilometers an hour if you're an elite marathon runner. But between those speeds, your cadence, so how many steps you take per minute should be anywhere from 170 to 190 steps per minute. What we see typically is a lot of people will be well below 170. So they'll be around 150, 160 steps per minute, which is indication of that your strides are too long. So obviously if you don't have someone to film you and see how long strides you're looking at and freeze frame every frame and see where you're striking, et cetera, it's um, difficult. The easiest way to do it is Set a metronome. There's um, plenty of free apps you can download uh, that um, uh, has a beat that goes at that pace. And what you want to focus on as you're listening to that beat 
is lifting your feet rather than putting them down. Lifting your feet leads to a bit a faster reaction. Um, and again, increasing um, frequency and reducing contact time. Um, and uh, same thing when it goes to walking. When you're listening to the, the beat, just focus on lifting rather than putting your foot down. Because again, the faster and the sooner you lift your leg into the so-called swing phase, the faster and quicker it will land under your center of mass as well. This is really amazing advice. Thank you so much. I'm definitely, when I'm listening to my house tunes as I'm walking to the station, I'm like heel strike, heel strike, heel strike, boots and cats and boots and cats. So this is very good advice for me. Um, I know that actually you and Joseph are doing some really groundbreaking work in terms of scientific the scientific literature, let's be honest, around footwear is grossly lacking. And I know this is something you're really excited to share with the world that you guys are actually planning on going, doing, conducting your own studies. Can you just give us some more background on this? Absolutely. Um, so um, to give the context first, in, in terms of the, the available scientific literature, there is um, more and more coming out today. But when we look back into the kind of emergence of footwear and foot um, research, um, when it became more and more popular, especially uh, around the 1960s, um, I mean, there's a lot of research pre that as well. And we have these historical books and articles from there as well, that um, a lot of the time they're even better and more insightful than the more modern research. But um, 1960s come where a lot of people started to um, engage in leisure activities and uh, running in particular is the world's most popular activity and still is today and was rapidly growing then. A lot of people um, uh, that started to run started to get a lot of injuries. So footwear developers started to try and um, develop shoes to accommodate this and trying to try and support the foot and postural faults in the foot, which they realized uh, stemmed from having shoes, um, modern footwear, right, that uh, cram the toes and leads to different types of postural faults of the foot. Uh, and what they started to do is trying to um, um, come up with ways they can construct the shoe so you can position the foot in a more natural position. Um, so a lot of the research from then um, and up till even the 90s and today was heavily focused on how we can um, position essentially the foot and specifically the rear foot in a better posture. Because when the toes get crammed and they lose their ability to control the rest of the foot, compensations, uh, apart from the visual deformities of the foot, there's postural compensations occurring at the rear foot where people either stand with their feet excessively rolled inwards or excessively rolled outwards. Um, so developing orthotics to support the arch to kind of reposition the foot was the main focal point of a lot of research. And um, obviously um, the curriculum of educations that, um, or universities that educate podiatrists and doctors that are specialized in this, the curriculum is based on the available research, right? So they learn how to correct postural faults using orthotics, um, which does help to a certain degree, but that was kind of the only focal area with no very little um, research and input into the forefoot and the toes and the function of the toes, which we already knew through certain pioneers in research, certain medical doctors that were already looking at this and realized this in the early 18th centuries, um, but for some reason got forgotten. Um, and um, through that lack of research um, it, within the forefoot, um, that kind of became the, the predominant mode of, uh, of, uh, of treatment. And there's also a factor in kind of capitalist societies where, you know, this is applied to the whole kind of medical system in a lot of capitalist societies where we, there is more profit in treating symptom rather than treating um, the, the root cause, right? So the system is kind of built in a way where it encourages the use of orthotics there's a lot of orthotics companies in the 60s, 70s that also uh, subsidized and sponsored a lot of research, obviously, in the use of these. In any case, more and more research is emerging now, but it's still highly lacking. Um, and we have always kind of been frustrated um, that we all, uh, that we kind of go back to research that is during the 18th century, people will tell us, oh, but that's outdated research that doesn't apply today, et cetera. 
Um, so there is a few gold nuggets in the modern research that we can refer to and more is coming out, but there needs to be um, more and there needs to be a bigger momentum. Um, so uh, Joe, who was on a trip to Sri Lanka um, earlier last year, he uh, noticed um, uh, there that there is a big difference in the shape of people's feet uh, that were living in rural areas uh, and the shape of people's feet that are living in urban areas. Obviously the people living in urban areas, typically barefoot farmers, et cetera, have beautifully wide, strong feet. Um, whereas the people in um, just, you know, five kilometers outside the rural area when you get into the city had these deformed kind of modern shoe shaped feet. So uh, we saw this as a fantastic opportunity to go out there and do a comparative research of how uh, footwear affects foot morphology and how foot morphology is then related to regional foot pain um, because um, if we look at the existing scientific literature, there's really two studies that have done this before. There's one a study that is very popular within kind of our community and field that everyone still refers to, the 1905 uh, study by Phil Hoffman. These uh, black and gray images you see typically of the, the, the true shaped foot and the natural shaped foot. And then there's another one done 2009. I forget the authors, um, but we can link in into the podcast. Um, is uh, where they looked at an ethnic, ethnic uh, group in India and a group in uh, the Netherlands and did a comparative study now using plantar pressure plate readings as well and tried to correlate that with uh, foot pain and foot deformities. Um, and there is still frustratingly enough a, a discussion as to the epidemiology of modern foot deformities. People, as you know, still are arguing, oh, well, Bunions is hereditary. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no exercise that's going to fix it. You have to operate it, et cetera, et cetera, amongst professionals, right? So we're very frustrated by this and we always have been. So we kind of thought, okay, well, if no one's going to do it, let's, let's do it ourselves. Um, it's a very ambitious plan, but it's something that we're very passionate about. And the goal is to, we just did the pilot study, by the way, um, this, this past Friday, you know, we had 50 people come into our studio and we, we went through the whole study, which was a good success. And we're going to uh, publish this and reveal the results as well. Unfortunately, we didn't have the kind of barefoot uh, control group and the, and the group with, with shoes, but it'll be a good way to see if the kind of system and the methodology works at least. But in any case, what we want to put, what we want to do with this first study, first of all, is to uh, create a clear definition when it comes to what is wide footwear and what is uh, narrow or inappropriate footwear. Because you'll have a lot of podiatrists, doctors recommend people that have foot deformities to get wider footwear or more accommodating footwear. But when you look at the shoes that are wide or wider, they're not really wide enough and they're still tapered in towards that point in the middle. They're still symmetrical. Um, so we need to build a clear, uh, a framework for professionals to use when they're recommending shoes to their clients, but also obviously to inform the public and show, kind of put the nail in the coffin. This is the root cause of modern foot deformities. End of discussions. And hopefully <laughs> that's our goal with, with, with that part at least. And then also to, again, link it to uh, common regional foot pain, right? So we know that having certain deformities in the feet has increases the risk of certain types of foot pain. And we want to establish this by uh, looking for the first time ever, one at a much bigger population group. So we're going to aim to look at a thousand people. The other two similar studies looking at this had about 250 people, which is a respectable sum, but we want a bigger sum. And also looking at the same ethnic groups, because another common argument is like, oh, well, you know, um, th that's a different ethnic group. They, they naturally have stronger feet. They, they are not as affected, et cetera. So we're gonna look at the same ethnic group as well and hopefully try and build momentum from there. And, and through this framework, our ambition is to do more studies. So looking at athletes, for example, not only the shoes that they're wearing during sports, but the shoes that they're wearing outside of sports and how this affects injury rates uh, and, and so on and so on. Um, so we're gonna travel out to um, Sri Lanka in November, um, end of October to November, we're gonna spend about three to four weeks there. Um, doing 50 people a day, hopefully. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. If you want to learn more about the um, study, um, we have a GoFundMe page where you can actually uh, sponsor us or uh, fund towards the study to get it um, going. We're going to do it regardless. We've, we've told ourselves that. 
but it's obviously amazing to get some support um, for from people that are interested in this. Do you know, Gorgon, there's an old phrase that says, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And right. I just want to commend you and Joseph for being wildly part of the solution and seeing as this is such an incredibly, um, it's so painful for me to watch athletes running around with the wrong footwear. <laughs> you're definitely oh, going to yeah. get some sponsorship from me because I'm like, <laughs> let's put an end to this, my brother. Let's team up. Um, I know that, that you all... You also have a really exciting project coming out with a new app, which is going to be free for people to use. And it's going to be an opportunity for them to learn more about their amazing feet, their foundations. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, our, our kind of mission and w when we started with this and even dating back to when we we're teaching personal trainers, we're, we're always very passionate about educating people. That is our kind of mission and educating people um, and um, doing it in a way that is digestible and very easily accessible as well. Um, uh, so that's where the app came in because we do have an online platform which is accessible through your phone and, um, and um, computer to get to our online educations as well. Um, but we want to be able to provide more, um, apart from our Instagram page, a more interactive way for people, a free to use tool essentially for people to learn more about their foot, to be able to assess their feet through clear guides, to be able to um, challenge themselves and to be able to encourage more people through this app to be um, taking more proactive approach when it comes to their foot health, essentially. So within that app, there'll be a lot of free tools that they can use. So they can assess themselves. They can even do assessments to see what types of workshops would be more appropriate for them. Uh, and also we'll have uh, sections where they can um, do different types of challenges to keep it fun and to keep learning uh, about their um, uh, what they need to improve uh, and also to keep them kind of consistent through time. But also there'll be a lot of other things um, such as uh, what we call the pillars of health, where it's not only about kind of foot shape and function, but obviously, as we know, there's a lot more to health that also impacts foot health. And that could be, for example, grounding. Uh, that's something that is also emerging now to be actually spending more time barefoot, not only for foot shape and function, but it also has a um, deeply um, positive physiological effect in our health as well. Um, we'll go into also breath work and cold exposure and some other things that can help people to um, inspire them to uh, lead a healthier lifestyle. Um, oh, thank you so much for sharing us about that. And I cannot wait to download it myself. Gorgon, quick question. It's a bit random and off topic, but one thing I ask all my guests at the end of every show is if you had one thing that you could tell the whole world, and it doesn't have to be related to anything we've spoken about, but what would your message to the world be? Wow, that's a difficult one. Um, one message. Um, well, it, it, it'd be wrong if I, it wouldn't be foot, foot related, uh, considering who I am, but. No, 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 one. it wouldn't be. Like just speak as, speak as Gorgon now. Don't worry about the, the title of being my foot function and being this like badass toe foot dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I think would be, uh, uh, Good message, but I think uh, a lot of people nowadays need to hear is, especially in today's world where we're just overwhelmed with so much input in terms of how you should be, what you should be, you know, particularly with social media, there's such an influence, even I get influenced uh, as a human, you know, too easily by just engaging too much in things that are not necessarily uh, seem to be true, but not necessarily true, it gives us kind of a skewed um, perception of what re reality is and how reality is and how you should be perceived. Um, so one thing would probably be just to kind of try and disengage from that constant input and stimulus uh, and be out in nature more and be more present. That's something I've <laughs> challenged with as well. Being so involved in the social media world, um, it does kind of disconnect you from the reality of, of the world essentially. So that I think is something that um, a lot of people um, would benefit greatly from, um, just to uh, be more present and be present with um, uh, anything but uh, technology, nature would probably be yeah. a good, good thing, I think. Oh my goodness. Well, I just feel like we're going full circle from being these primal animals that would like scratch around in the dirt. <laughs> 
to evolving into these really highly advanced alien like creatures that are just on these weird devices. And now we're starting to really feel the brunt of it. And very, very slowly, I'm not saying we're there yet, but slowly people are like, maybe we should just get back to where we were and scratch around <laughs> in the dirt again. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, it uh, exactly right. And I think a, a combination of both would be optimal. It's, it's unavoidable in the, in the environment we live in. But I think if we could take um, wisdom from, from our past and, and what our bodies uh, truly need and uh, adapt that into our current environment, I think that would uh, be the best. That would be a good one. I know. In fact, there was like, I don't know how they did this, but I remember reading a fascinating book, which I'm sure many of you guys have have read as well, called Sapiens from Haval Noah Harari, a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. I actually read it twice. I found it so good. And when they, I don't know how they would do this because obviously they couldn't brain scan people who lived as hunter gatherers, but apparently their brains were a lot denser and they were far, far smarter than the population is today. And they had to remember all the different foods that would be poisonous or edible they had to remember where they've hidden things they had to be quite smart about navigating very complex dangerous situations they had to cooperate in large groups you know they're all these fascinating things and you know in contrast our lives are very very vanilla yeah it's it's a very fascinating thing obviously because we've externalized um everything to us in terms of categorization and memory storage right so we don't have to which is a benefit as well, because there is so much more that we have to take in today, right? As opposed to what they did maybe back then. So there is a benefit, but because of the way, I guess we work as humans, where we're constantly striving for, you know, energy efficiency, both in, in how much energy the brain spends in doing certain tasks, but also physically, we naturally tend to overuse certain things right so oh, oh the over reliance of um storing what we need to know in external um uh, means and uh that i think um can be a dangerous path uh, but yeah fascinating very fascinating read absolutely gorgon it's time for us to end the show but before i say goodbye to you can you just tell people where they could find out more about you and joseph and what you guys are doing Absolutely. So you can find us at myfootfunction.com. That is our website. <laughs> and uh, you can find us on Instagram uh, uh, at myfootfunction. Um, that's probably the best sources. Uh, we will uh, update everything um, there is to know about our app, about our uh, research um, uh, project going on through the website and through Instagram as well. Uh, we do have also our education platform, which you can reach through the MyFoot Function website. So I'll actually just leave it to those things to avoid um, too many things to remember. Simple, simple, <laughs> best. <laughs> simple is always best. So thank you, MyFoot Function, both you and Joseph. And also, um, thank you for coming on Love at First Science. It's always such a pleasure talking to you i feel like we need to like have a beer one day and get geeky about feet in person <laughs> um and yeah just in the meantime sending you guys so much good energy and positivity for the research that you've got coming up and in addition to the new app that you're launching i really wish you every success thank you so much les it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today and i look forward to more conversations <laughs>